the House will proceed to public business. The motion before the House is the Huxley Memorial debate that the doctrine of creation is more valid than the theory of evolution. And the speakers, Theodore Wilson, Regent's Park Standing Committee, Emma Jenks, Trinity Treasurer, Professor Edgar Andrews, Queen Mary College, London, Dr. Richard Dawkins, New College, Peter Ross, New College, Daniel Asif, New College, <laughs> Professor Arthur Wilder-Smith, Professor of Pharmacology and Consultant from Geneva, and Professor Maynard Smith, Professor of Biology, University of Sussex. <coughs> teller for the eyes is Bob Barlow, New College, and teller for the nose, Barbara Hammond Schamberger, St. Catherine's. This is a New College debate. Tellers will take up their places at the conclusion of the Honourable Opposer's speech and will remain until called upon to withdraw. Honourable members, wishing to vote after the tellers have taken up their position, may do so by walking through one of the doors marked eyes and nose. Any honourable member, member who wishes to abstain from voting should notify the tellers. I would like to remind honourable members that they may vote only once. Should they require to leave the chamber more than once, kindly inform the tellers that you have already voted. I would also like to remind the honourable members that of late, at times the House has fallen into the habit of calling honourable members by their first names. Under the rules of the society, kindly refer to other members as either the honourable member or the honourable speaker. And without any further ado, I call on Theodore Wilson's Regents Park and Standing Committee to propose the motion standing in his name. Madam President, I said in the letter to you in Hillary a term of last year when I heard you speak for the first time that you were one of the best speakers that I had ever seen and I had ever heard. And I say that this Hillary to you in person. I also would like to thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak. And at this time, I would like to introduce the guests for this evening. On the opposition side, we have the Honorable Treasurer, Emma Jinks, who happens to be my neighbor. We have <laughs> Dr. Richard Dawkins from New College, the zoologist and renowned author. We have Danielle Seif from New College and contributor to Debate Magazine. We also have Professor John Maynard Smith, the professor of biology of the University of Sussex. Now on the proposition side with me, we have Professor Edgar Andrews, Queen College, Queen's Mary College, London. <laughs> We have Peter Ross, New College. We have Professor Arthur Wilder Smith, Professor of Pharmacology and Consultant of, from Geneva. I'd like to say at this time that I know that this is a very hot issue. And so I want to make it perfectly clear that I don't, I don't come here tonight as a Bible thumper or a scripture quoter, for this is not a church but a debating <coughs> chamber, and this is not a pulpit but a debating dispatch box nor think that we on this side of the house represent the radical right Falwellian fundamentals. Truly, we accept the recent findings of archaeologists. We now know that in the beginning, the earliest man was a man by the name of Kibelman. Kibelman had no form of communication, and so all that he could do was just make gestures and grunts. <laughs> Then after Kibo Man came Oriole Man. <laughs> now Oriole Man developed a prim primitive tribal culture which was known as rowing. <laughs> but the big breakthrough came with Pembroke Man. Pembroke Man was the first person to be able to use words, but unfortunately not in the right order. <laughs> now all of these type of men unfortunately died out because they were unable to procreate. You see, unlike us on this side, they were able to grow the creation. Honorable Member, sir, I am an oral man. <laughs> and I can speak. Thank you very much. Honorable Members, I come forward to say that this motion before you this evening should not be perceived as a debate of fact over fiction or fantasy 
over reality. The motion, as it is read, if somebody can pick it up, let's, let's look at it together. <laughs> let's make sure that we see what it says. It says that the doctrine of creation is more valid than the theory of evolution. We're not discussing two conflicting doctrines, and we're not talking about two conflicting theories. One is a doctrine, the other is a theory. No doubt, the reason that I say that is to say this, that both those who believe in the theory of evolution and those who believe in the doctrine of creation each have something to say. One makes an attempt to explain how we got here. Another makes an attempt to explain why we are here. In many respects, the two are very complementary. And perhaps that's why Dr. Martin Luther King once said that science keeps religion from sinking into the valley of crippling irrationalism. And re religion prevents science from falling into the marshes of moral nullism. The doctrine of creation is a declaration of faith. It is a declaration that concerns the existence of men and women here and now. It is a doctrine that gives a spiritual explanation for what scientists have tried to give an intellectual explanation. It is a doctrine that gives a mental picture of why things as they were were transformed into the way they are now. It is a descriptive, picturesque account of why the cornerstone of the universe was laid, of why the stars are the silver splendor of space, of why the measurements were set for the foundation of Earth. It is a doctrine that points to something greater than ourselves as the source for all that is and all that is to come. It is a doctrine that puts this terrestrial ball and all that are on it under the microscope of purpose. For what is life without purpose? Aristotle called it the unmoved mover. Plato called it the supreme form of the good. It is not a wonder then that Immanuel Kant said that without, without a moral, you cannot make any moral sense of the universe without a doctrine of creation. No person on this side of the house would be foolish enough to say that everything in the theory of evolution is wrong. I hope not. Now. But I stand on this side of the house not to support the teaching of by the banning of evolution in schools, nor do I believe that fossils were planted solely to taste, test one's faith in God, nor do I believe that it was to undermine <coughs> one's faith by Lucifer, are purely the remains of animals caught in the great flood. Truly, these are the most bogus ideas that I've ever heard, and they're the tenets of only a few. <laughs> Those who are not rational enough to take and accept from the evolutionist theory that which is true and decipher from it that which is false. Yet still, too many have tried to criticize, nitpick, and downplay the doctrine of creation as being merely a second-rate theory held by those religious dogmatists who's, who blind themselves to the truth. The people on this side of the house would not deny any observed, documented, biological changes that those on that side of the house wish to make for the representation of their stand. Those who support the doctrine of creation can accept microevolution. What is questionable, however, is macroevolution. It is true that environmental surroundings can transform and instigate changes with certain particular species, but is it true that environmental surroundings can transform a certain species into another species? It has been true that environmental surroundings also can, through environmental surroundings, you can change things like, for instance, moss, transmutations of light moss into brown moss. But does it follow then that environmental surroundings also can make transmutations from moss to dragonflies? Of course not. Moss are no more than moss, monkeys are no more than monkeys, and man is no more than man. Man might act like an ape, eat like a pig, look like a goat, think like a jackass, be as stubborn as a mule, or as ugly as the honorable secretary. <laughs> but a man is still a man and has been that way all through recorded history. Now Professor Dawkins is going to undoubtedly tell us that a thousand years are the thousands of years of recorded history 
is not enough sufficient time to manifest any evolutionary process. He's going to tell this house that millions of years were required for certain kinds of living species. Now that's what he's going to tell you. What he means is, is that although if put to the test, we cannot explain or show evolutionary process, you should accept it just as a fact. That is not scientific fact, that's scientific faith. You can't have it both ways. You can't accuse theologians of being without facts and then turn around and use your scientific theory based upon faith. Madam President, I tell you and I tell this House, that is scientific faith. Professor Dawkins wrote in an article in New Scientist that Charles Darwin showed how it was possible for blind physical forces to mimic the effects of conscious design. That is like the university press having an explosion of ink and coming up with the dictionary. The odds against that happening are 10 to the 40,000th power. I'm not a betting man, but I certainly wouldn't want to bet on those odds. <laughs> Ms. Seif, even in her article, The Debate Magazine, I, I admire you for being reasonable enough to point out that the sparsity of the fossil records. And true, you are right to do so. For when one considers that the total number of fossils is close to 100,000, and out of which basically only the horse and the elephant have any morphological sequence, where is the proof for any major assumptions of transmutation? Where is the proof? Madam Treasurer, when you stand on, this, on the op opposing side to, for this motion, explain to this House how the second law of thermodynamics, which gives the reason why organisms die out and things wear out, is exactly converse to the principles of evolution. Show us, Professor Smith, show us, Professor Smith, why matter arose from non-living matter. Show us how spontaneous generation could occur only once. Show us how viruses, bacteria, plants, animals, and men are all related. Show us this proof. Give us the ocular proof. The fact of the matter is that you can't. As Michael Denton said, the molecular biologist pointed out in his book, Evolution, A Theory in Crisis, there it is right there. <laughs> Even Darwin had to admit that he had absolutely no hardcore empirical data, no concrete evidence, no substantial scientific fact, nothing to prove any of the major evolutionary transformations he actually occurred, he asserted. It was Darwin, the author of the evolutionary theory himself, that confessed in a letter to Ossie Gray on the 5th of September, 1857, and I quote, one's imagination must fill up the very blanks. Honorable members, <laughs> with testimony, with testimony like this from the author himself, I submit that the theory of evolution is lacking in facts, but not in imagination. It is a convincing scientific account, but not convincing in the sense that it's confused. And I'm confused on this point. <laughs> the doctrine of creation, however, is important because it gives us a purpose. It explains something that scientific theory could not, even if it wanted to. We on this side of the house are not blind to the truth. Rather, it is that we agree with Darwin's associate, Thomas Huxley, who in the debate in 1860 said that I would prefer to be the descendant of a humble monkey than of those men who employ their knowledge and eloquence in misrepresenting those who are wearing out their lives in the search of truth. Honorable members, theology, philosophy, those that happen to be in those disciplines are in the search of the truth. We try to explain things in, in the why as opposed to the how. And I beg to propose this motion.